So in the show, I have the pleasure of speaking with Michael Episcope. Michael is the principal of Origin Investments, co-chairs the investment committee and oversees investor relations, marketing and company operations. Now, Origin is in the top 1% of real estate North American based fund managers. And Michael brings over 25 years of investment and risk management experience to the company. And he believes that calculated risk taking in inefficient markets is the key to building wealth. He regularly contributes to Forbes, Entrepreneur and Huff post and as well as frequently speaks on stage and on many investment podcasts across this awesome country. I'm really pumped and excited to have him on the show today to share his incredible knowledge with us. G'day, Michael. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today, mate? Thanks for having me, Reid. Mate, uh, we're talking a little bit offline uh, and I was prepping you for this question, but I ask all my guests when they come on this show is, rewind the clock and tell me how you made your first ever dollar as a kid. I have to uh, think about that for a second, even as you were saying. I mean, it's somewhere between snow shoveling and probably mowing lawns, but I'm going to say snow shoveling because that the barriers to entry of that were really, really small and I grew up in Chicago. And Chicago area, I should say, the suburbs of Chicago. And, you know, back in the 80s, we had a lot of snow. And um, I think it was just kind of in my DNA. I always wanted to work, make money. I was restless. Um, and so when we had a snow day, my friend and I just kind of looked at each other. We we're probably like 10 years old. And, and we grabbed our shovels and just went door to door. And he took one side of the street. I took the other. And when we got somebody on the line, I mean, we would charge, I think, 5 to $7, you know, for a, a, a driveway and a sidewalk. And that was a lot of money back then, um, you know, especially for a 10-year-old kid. And it was great. And, and, you know, back then, I mean, we would go out from 8 in the morning and not come home till 8 in the night. I'm not even sure if we ate lunch. <laughs> um, and sometimes we would clear like $100 each. And wow. it was just fantastic, you know. And so a lot of that money went into our uh, BMX bikes and other places that we wanted to spend it. But um, yeah, that was, that was probably, you know, if I think back, you know, just my, my first work experience, if you will, where we really went out and it was more than $1, but um, you know, that, that was definitely uh, kind of set the stage for later on. Hardworking blue collar work ethic, right? Getting on the getting on the tools and shoveling away at a young age produces uh, some pretty pretty awesome results. I know I grew up with myself as well from a young age, just you know not coming from a, a massive wealthy family, pretty pretty uh, middle of the road, and just had to make my own dollar uh, from when I, as soon as I was thirteen years of age. I think I was down the local cafe trying to get a job mopping floors. So awesome stuff. Um, Talk, talk about your, your background and your upbringing in Chicago. You know, went to university. You, we'll get into your story of starting Origin Investments in a bit. But what's what's the the early days of of Michael in your background in terms of you know, getting involved in, in real estate? Uh, yeah, if you want to go way back, I mean, I, I was probably 12, 13, 14 years old when I um, was working with my grandfather. He was buying buildings through tax sales in the 1970s in Chicago. That was when, you know, the West side, the South side of Chicago, everything was on sale and buildings were literally, you could buy them for paying the taxes. It was nothing. And so he was, um, you know, he built a portfolio. He was in real estate. I would go there and uh, help him when I was younger. He put me to work, uh, turned me loose with a, a screwdriver. And we used to go into other buildings and salvage doors and locks and, um, all kinds of stuff because uh, when you're running real estate, especially at that level, I mean, that, that was class C minus less. Um, it was really rough stuff, but you couldn't afford to go and buy things from the local hardware store. You actually had to go to these um, buildings that were being demolished. And so when I was younger, that was my summer job. And we used to go there and it was kind of eye opening because we would go into these um, office buildings, for example, and we would take off the hinges and the doorknobs and the electrical outlets and things like that and have this five gallon bucket that if you went to the hardware store, it would probably cost you $250 for all this stuff. And the guy would be like, yeah, give me uh, five bucks for that and five bucks for that. And, and it was just, but that's, but, and then we stored all this stuff in these buildings. And when he had to change the lock set, he reached into that, that was his inventory. And it really taught me at a, at a young age, how to, you know, like create value and pinch pennies and watch the expenses and, and run a building. Now, now we don't do things, you know, of that nature. We're not in a class C, we're more on the class A side because in life you have to figure out what you want to do and what you don't want to do. And I think that, you know, some of that taught me that I wanted to work, but I didn't necessarily want to be in that particular area you know, of real estate. So that's how I got my early, um, you know, just kind of, uh, you know, 
vibe for, for real estate or fix for real estate. And then it kind of, it came back full circle. So my first career was in commodities trading. I, I ended up um, uh, starting in that business at the young age of 19 years old. I was going to school at the time, DePaul University. And I just fell in love with it on a summer job. And I said, yeah, I'm going to stay down here. And I pushed all my classes tonight. I worked, um, you know, just burn the, cam- the, the candle at both ends, making it work. Because I really wanted to work, but I also wanted to fulfill my obligation to go to college and graduate, you know, for my parents and stuff. And, and it was really, um, it was a great time because I was studying finance and economics at DePaul and I was learning about how, it, how the world, especially through commodities, like behaved to what was happening in you know, the, the economics of the world. And, and those were the financial markets. So it was kind of a cool time in a, a city to learn about those things. And then I got an opportunity to trade finally when I, um, when I was about 27 years old, January 1st of 1997. Um, that was the, the beginning of my trading career. And I traded for about nine years and put a really, um, you know, kind of hard nine years in. Um, I say hard, meaning I worked hard. It wasn't, you know, hard. I mean, trading actually was something that came very easy to me. And I ended up, um, you know, my, my risk profile changed at the end there, right? I had set out to make X. I made, you know, 10X of what I set out to. At the end, when, you know, I started, I was single. When I was done, I was married. I had two kids. I had another one on the way. I said, you know what? I'm done. Right. I've accomplished enough mm-hmm. on this stage. I want to go on to something else. I was too young, though. I was 35, maybe 36 at that time, um, left the business and said, what do I want to do? And real estate then just kind of crept up into my system again. You know, I said, well, this is what I want to do, because the next phase of my life was really about, OK, I'm, I'm asset rich. But now how do I create income? How do I grow my assets? And, and all too many times, I mean, I have, you know, I think like so many people, a, a fear of failure and want financial freedom and all that. So I didn't want to be one of these people who ever said I used to be rich, right? So I really made a concerted effort. I went back to school again. I went to DePaul. I got my master's in real estate. I connected with my partner during that same period. We started Origin Investments in 2007. And, you know, that it was one of the best things I, I ever did. And, and the reason why we started it was, number one, there was a void in the market. And we just, we just couldn't find um, anybody who would be as good of stewards with our money as we would be. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to create an institutional real estate platform or all the qualities of an institutional real, real estate platform, but for us for people like us. And then that's what we did. And that was always the vision. Now, I will tell you in 2007, we had, you know, no business plan. We had no vision. We were just two guys running around trying to invest our money in great deals. And then that sort of organically, um, when the deals were maybe a little bit too big, we went out to friends and family and it started growing. And we went from two people to eight investors, to 10, to 20, to 30, to 50. To today, we have more than um, 2,000. And we've come a long way from the beginning where it was, you know, two guys buying real estate. So we have a, a team of 35. We're headquartered in Chicago. We have five offices around the country. We have roughly around 10,000 multifamily units, um, either in the development stage or built and under our management. So it's it's been a, um, a fantastic run. And we operate, um, I think we're on our seventh fund now. And I'm, I'm really proud that we have consistently, all our returns have been in the top decile of performance, if not better, right? Um, and so as a manager, Prequin just came out and ranked us as a top decile manager. And actually, I think we fall in like the top 2% when they're looking, you know, our rank, I think is 15 out of like 1800 managers. And it's not because one fund hit it out of the park. It's because of the consistency across our funds, top decile, top decile, top quartile, top decile. So, you know, I, I feel like we've lived our mission and stayed true to who we are. And we're not one of these firms that had started with the individual and the high net worth and then went to the institutions and the $20, $30 million. We found a way to scale in the individual market and still produce a great product. That's that's an incredible, incredible journey, my friend. Uh, I, when, you, when you said two, two guys... Two guys, a girl, and a pizza place, right? You know, starting starting a, a, a real estate company, but but growing that seems like it's been an extremely intense journey. Where, where what was that first deal like? Because so many listeners on this show 
I, I interview a lot of big CEOs. I, I just interviewed Mark uh, Hamilton from Hamilton Zance out of San Francisco. Yeah. Like talking about those guys start, and he also, like yourself, had a start in the mid-2000s. Mid how, how beneficial was it in and around the, the, the 2008 crash to, to be starting it in that, in that era? Well, it, it was really beneficial, but you have to remember my partner and I didn't have a real, we didn't have, you know, for one, the, the luggage and the baggage that a lot of people had coming into 2008. So that was a huge benefit. We also though, didn't have the same pedigrees as people had been in the market for 10, 15 years. So by the time I got into real estate, um, I was 37 years old and we were sort of figuring it out and we didn't have the advantage of hindsight. So we made a lot of mistakes along the way. I mean, not, I, I'm not going to say like we made investing mistakes, but at that time, like even when you made an investment mistake, it was, it was the difference between, okay, maybe you should have made two or three X on your money and you may only made like 1.1 X or 1.2 X, you know? And so that was sort of the, the birth of our, our platform and the learning stage. And, and trust me, there's a lot of stuff I wish we would have done differently. And I wish I had the knowledge today back then, because instead of this have taken 14 years, this would have probably taken four years, right? It would have been <laughs> where we are back in 2012 and not 2021. So, um, but a lot of, you know, a lot of learnings from that, um, you know, we were growing, we were building a team, we were trying to figure it out. We didn't have a coherent plan and it just sort of came together. And, and we just, you know, at every stage, we just tried to make good decisions, right? Good decisions around our capital, treat the investor well, um, you know, and, and do the things that we knew would help us in the long run. And, and I think that's one thing that we've always done well is looked out at the horizon and said, look, what do we want to be when we grow up? How is this going to impact us in the future? And, you know, you can't get so excited about mistakes that happen today or get so down on yourself. And you have to remember, you know, just along the journey where you are, mistakes and, and failures happen and you, you have to fail forward and just continually go and, and understand like investing, um, you know, it's, you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. Right. But the, the outliers on the upside, and that's the interesting thing about it all, as long as you don't make the big ones along the way, right. Is, and, and there's some things that you can do. And, and I, I've studied a lot of different individuals and companies. And, you know, I would say that one thing my partner and I are really good at is risk management and just looking at, okay, well, how do other people go broke? Right. What don't we want to do? Because the things you don't do are equally as important as the things that you do do. Right. And, and talking to people over that time and you look at people who come out of 07 and 08 and 09, um, you know, a lot of people went bust because they guaranteed bank loans. I don't need to guarantee bank loans. I don't want to do that. My partner doesn't do that. We just don't do it. Like, like it's a line in the sand and our team knows that. Um, Cross collateralizing assets. Right. The banks all want you. Well, hey, you know, we're going to put this deal in your portfolio. Can we have a security interest on your other assets? The answer is no. Rather pay more on that side because what happens when you're running a fund or a portfolio and you start guaranteeing assets as individuals and cross collateralizing, you've created a house of cards and you've exposed yourself to exponential risk. And what a lot of people don't understand is that when that happens and you're in a fund, you're actually taking more risk than you are in an, indiv than in an individual deal. Because when one card falls, they all fall. And there's plenty of investors who I spoke to on the, on the you know, back end of 2008, 9, 10, who were in these funds who, you know, ended up um, just, they blew up and they, and they lost all their money. And I was just like, what do you mean you lost all your money? How do you lose all of your money in a fund? If you have 20 deals in there and 10 of them go broke, 10 of them still have value. Well, that's the answer is that, you know, these um, managers we're just taking outsized risk with other people's money. And, and by the way, that's what drove us to origin because I had been in those deals before. And I was like, look, if this is the best that's out there and this is what people are doing with my capital, I can do a better job and my partner. And, and that's why like all of these things that you learn and these little secrets, you know, that nobody teaches you about, you learn the hard way, but then you do them right the next time. Right, right. I, I want to say, and, and for all those people listening out there, did you hear Michael didn't get started till he was 37 years of age? I talked to a lot of people on this show who are young guys, and I, t I was actually having a coffee today with someone who's a kid. He's 24, and he's stressing out that he hasn't got his first deal done. I was like, dude, you're 24. Relax. Like, you're going to be just fine. So I just want to say that that's, that's, that's freaking awesome. You didn't start the company till you know, in your mid-30s, mid and you're crushing it today. I also think that the big – you're right. The big mistakes in a fund 
and I, I've done individual deals. You know, I've got about 3,000 units today. I've never done the fund model yet. We've just done boot, bootstrap by bootstrap. But, but hearing that and listening to you say don't cross collateralize is so important. What other major tips and a piece of advice do you have for people in the sense of trying to build a foundation of non-risk, or as you said, risk adjustment or risk management? What, what, what other sort of tips, maybe two or three more that you would, you would give to people listening to the show? People. Bet on people, not deals. Um, you know, th there's so many of these platforms out there today that um, are, are just pushing deals in front of people, one after the other after the other. And, and I think all too often that, um, you know, th that there's this propensity to build your own portfolio, do a deal, do a deal, do a deal, and you're spreading the risk and that's fine. And you can build a portfolio and there's inherent advantages and disadvantages and all that. But when you're all of a sudden, you know, doing this with 15 other sponsors and you're assuming that somebody else has done the due diligence, you're exposing yourself to more risk and headache than you think. And, you know, if you're in this business long enough, you realize and you understand that it's about the people, right? And I'll, I will, in any of my investments, take a little bit lower of a return or forecast a return to be in a deal with a really good sponsor because things will go wrong. And when they go wrong, people behave differently. And when you're all of a sudden in a deal with 20 sponsors, right? Somebody in there, maybe one or two or three are going to behave, you know, like you've increased your risk of bad behavior. Whereas if you find somebody who's really good, just go deep with them in a lot of different deals, right? And so that's what I, I try to, um, you know, tell people when they're getting into real estate that you have to be careful about how you build your own portfolio, but, but bet on people. It's like any other business out there, right? Don't, focus on the real estate so much as the individuals who are behind it, how, what kind of risk they're taking, is there alignment in the deal, what is their track record, what are some things that they've done in the past that maybe they didn't need to do, right, that, were, that speak to their character and, and how they're going to behave going forward. Oh, I, I love that. It's 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 so important. And I mean, when I first tried to raise my first hundred thousand dollars, it was actually got nothing to do with the deal and everything to do with the trust in the person. And and so many people, when you are starting in the syndication world or raising money, whatever, whatever it is, the deal comes second. It's it's you as the human being first. That 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 is important when you're asking for that capital or people that are, that are trusting in you. So I I love that. Um, Pivoting now a little bit, you mentioned you're, you're, you're across five different, you've got, uh, you got 35 in the team, five different offices across the country. What are you seeing in today's market? Like, obviously, I'm, I'm at the coalface as well, digging away in certain markets. How, any, any sort of parallels to pr history? Because <laughs> it seems very frothy coming out of COVID yeah. and, and, and the pricing right now is absolutely through the roof. So I, I, I agree. Our strategy, we have three strategies. We build, we buy, and we lend. And that middle strategy of buying, we're doing zero in that. I would say our strategy today is build, sell, and lend. And that's what we're doing. And that's how we're protecting our capital. Because the market right now, I, I mean, I've said this so many times. And if anybody's seen me before, they've heard me say this. But in the value-add market, it doesn't make sense to us today. Where product that's 10 years old is trading for replacement cost or 10, 20, 30% above it. And if we can build brand new for the same price and then have a development margin on top of that, um, I'd, I'd much rather build. It's actually a lower risk proposition to get into the market. And just, you know, like when people think about this, if you're buying a brand new multi, not, not a brand, sorry, a, a 10 year old multifamily property that requires a value add, right? First value add and you're paying 220 a unit and you need $15,000 and now your basis is 235 and your exit assumption is, you know, 280,000. Wouldn't you rather just build brand new for 210,000 a unit? And, and those are the economics. So, so there's so much demand right now because there's the fundamentals favor the housing market. There's a huge shortage on the for sale side, which is keeping people in the rental side and the demographics. Now the next generation is moving up and, and the generation right now, the millennials are sort of trapped in the renter. So you have this um, almost perfect storm of housing that's going on where housing prices are going up and rental prices are going up because there's such a shortage on all ends. At some point that is going to, um, rectify itself, right? These imbalances can't happen forever. So just be careful what you believe, right? Like everybody has a model that forecasts out two, three, four, five years, but I'll tell you this right now, every model is wrong. We've never, ever in the history of our firm, and nobody can go on this show and say they've ever 
modeled correctly the next five years, right? You meander like this and you get to the end point in different ways, but every single one of our deals, we underwrite to kind of doubling our equity over a five-year period, and none of them have done that. Some of them have been one five X, some of them have been three X, some of them have been five X even, you know? And so you, you just have to be careful about falling for the financials and you really have to step out and look at the fundamentals of the market and saying, hey, this doesn't make sense, right? Because things that don't make sense, walk away, stay in cash, invest in something else, play another day or find another place for your money. And that's kind of what we're doing today. Will you, do you think there's, there will be a retraction of, of, of costs, uh, sorry, of, of pricing? Because you mentioned price per pound. And I talk, I've talked to a couple of people on the show about the obsolescence of these you know, existing nine, you know, C-class buildings that I'm seeing in Phoenix trade for over 220 a door, right? They're already at replacement costs, which is just nuts to me. And yeah. so, you know, and, and my rule of thumb is, you know, you've got to increase the value of that asset by 50%. Right, so you got you bought, say at two hundred k a door. You got to sell that in five years' time for a mid teen IRR to your investors of about three hundred k a door. And do you believe in that? Right, and yeah. that backs into rent growth. And so, what are your thoughts on, on on these obsolescent assets trading at that to try and achieve these bigger premiums ver- in a secondary market like Phoenix versus where say you're in Chicago, I'm in LA. I know a value add property in Torrance, one hundred twenty units, is going for over four hundred fifty k a door for for an eight for an eighties product. And in, in some markets, right, where there's true barriers to entry, you might um, be able to justify that if it's truly irreplaceable real estate. But, um, you know, there, there tends to be this propensity as the market, um, you know, is in these periods of calm that people continue to reach out on the risk spectrum to get yield. And, and you know, in, in 2000. 12, 13, around that time, everybody was trying to buy up the really high quality A A assets, right? And then they moved to the B assets and now they're moving to the C assets to try to get the yield. So I will tell you right now that um, if there's a recession and there could be in the next two years, I'm not trying to forecast one, but what happens in a recession is that the lowest end um, of the demographic segregation, right? They tend to have the highest unemployment. And those are the people who are um, renting in the class C apartment. So you have a disproportionate amount of people who are um, who are unemployed in class C. And what happens is they empty out, right? You start getting bad debt, you get higher vacancy. And, and I've seen you know, a lot of people on that side, they claim, oh, well, these are more workforce housing. These are, that's not true at all. Like in 2008, 9, 10, we were buying stuff in Atlanta. I mean, class C housing at that time for $12,000 a door, right? Stuff that was $80,000 a door two years before, right? Where your class A, that is more your renter by choice. People who have college degrees, people who have um, just a lot of discretionary income, good credit. They're not likely to get laid off, right? So you're still going to suffer. It's just the magnitude by which you suffer along that spectrum. But that's kind of what I what I see going on. And you mentioned, you know, Class C going for 220. I scratched my head. Now, your earlier question is: Am I predicting a, a price um, reduction or, or some, you know, something happening? Um, there's two ways that that this can come back to balance. Number one is, yes, you can go into a recession and all this stuff can come back into balance. And the second way is that you just have replacement cost that goes to the moon and just continues to go and escalate. So instead of, you know, that, that project that you're talking about, that Class C at 220, well, if brand new um, construction costs you $500,000 a unit, then 220 doesn't look that bad, Right. right? And so that's one way that you can get out of this. But what will happen is that those properties will have anemic growth because they're just being overpaid for. And that's why, like when we're looking at ground up development, if replacement cost does go to 500,000, I'm using extremes, right? $500,000 per unit. When you're in brand new product, right, that you're delivering today and the new replacement cost is 30, 40% higher, your building is going to be worth that much more at delivery, right? right? So we think that that's the place that, you know, is the greatest risk adjusted um, place for capital today, where you're going to get the highest risk adjusted returns. Um, you know, that's that's my opinion though, right? Is, is you can either have a recession, which brings it into in, back to balance, or you can have, you know, just replacement costs running up. I'm sure there's other ways too, but those are the ones that come to mind. And what markets are you you hunting in right now? So um, I can name them, but um, they're the easiest way. Sunbelt, think of that, yep. um, and yep. South, low tax states, Southeast, Texas, Southwest. Um, you know, we're looking for business friendly, climate friendly states. 
um, secondary cities. So the Denver's, the Phoenix, the Charlotte's, um, Nashville's of the world. So, and, and they've really, like, we've benefited a lot in our previous funds because we were located in those markets through COVID. We had no idea what was happening in COVID. And then we came out the other side and it's like having a gift. So in all of those funds, we are selling more real estate into today's market than we have in the last seven or eight years combined. That's that's incredible. And what what's the... What's the next five years got in store for Origin coming out of out of post COVID, and, and and we've talked a lot about COVID on this show, but but what do you, what are your what's your envisaging envisaging I should say with the with the with the buy sell lend model or you know so, so to speak. So when we think about the growth of Origin, we we want to create products that really span the spectrum, regardless, because we have two thousand investors and everybody has um, a different. Uh, a different goal in their, you know, the reason why they want to get into real estate, whether it's income or whether it's growth or growth and income and something in between. So we've created products that cater to those needs. And so we really, we're not, we're only growing within those funds and growing operations and personnel and making sure that we can continue to deliver the same value that we have, you know, for the next five years that we have for the last 10, 12 years at the firm. And so that just means that we're hiring the right people, that we're using technology to make us more efficient, constantly improving our processes, looking where to pick up the pennies, the nickels, the dime. And, you know, um, it's really been an evolution for us because if you look back even at our previous funds, we're far different today than we were three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And 10 years ago, we were agnostic about um, asset class, right? We did everything because that was the market, right? You put money into something, whether it was student housing or retail or industrial, you were going to make money. And so today's world, though, capital is far more of a commodity and it really takes operational uh, expertise to compete. And you have to understand um, block by block when you're looking at real estate, but you also have to understand the nuts and bolts, the pennies, the nickels, the dimes, how to save on insurance and personnel and all and, and taxes and all the things that go into the equation because the margins are really, really low on real estate and you have to be able to compete at that margin. And it's not the same as it was, you know, like in the past, I think going forward, it's all going to be about specialization and expert um, operational expertise. One thing you mentioned earlier was technology. What data are you using in, in order to keep you guys at the forefront to making the right investment decisions? Given your history, 10,000 yeah. units, I'm sure you'd have to be using data internally to make that better investment decision in the future. So, yeah, in, in fact, um, if, if you think about the way real estate is modeled, growth is one of the most important variables that you have to get right. Put it, any model will work if you put enough growth into the equation, right? Sure. So one of the things over that's been a real pain point for us is we always um, lease external data. To the groups that are out there, they provide you with growth rates and markets. And it was always a black box. Well, how do they do this? We were never comfortable. They never back test. They never shared information. And so what we did about two years ago is we hired two data scientists from the University of Chicago to come in and help us with this problem. We said, look, we don't believe that this is a really, this is a good product that we're leasing, right? And this is such a fundamentally important part of our business that we want to build something. And so we've been working on something for two years and it's really an econometric model that forecasts growth rate by analyzing data from over, you know, 5 million pieces of data from over a hundred sources that are aggregated in each and every market. And I will tell you, um, unquestionably, it's way more accurate and a much better tool than anything we could have rented. So for us, it's it's a huge uh, resource, um, you know, for our team looking at new markets, where do we want to be, growth rates, we're forecasting them. Because as you know, you know, you, you look at these markets and generally, you know, a responsible growth rate to put in to a deal is maybe two and a half to 5%, right? At the most that you would ever do. I don't think we've ever done five. If I see... <laughs> If I see over three and a half in a model, I'm, I'm basically killing the deal because we want multiple ways to win. Well, our model was successful at forecasting the growth rate in Phoenix. And, and we looked at it when it was doing this a year ago. And we're like, look, the model is broken. There's no way Phoenix is going to grow you know, at the high teens. Like this doesn't work. And we're looking at models and we're constantly evaluating. Well, sure enough, you look at what happened in Austin. You look at what happened in Phoenix. And for us, right, it, it's been really difficult for us in the past to compete because I would consider us more as a value buyer 
than a momentum buyer. And, and you get some people who go in there and they're like, look, I'm going to, you know, I just want to be in this Phoenix market and I'm going to plug in 6% and make this deal work and forget about it. Right. That's not how we are. Right. So, you know, for years past, it's been a challenge for us to compete in these markets, but if we can get in there early and we can build in those markets and capture some of those growth rates, we're in a fantastic position because those are properties that we'll build at a great basis and we'll just enjoy that rent growth going forward. I love it. I oh, absolutely love it. I think it's so important to be using that data and 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 looking at your history and track record to help you make better decisions. And, and even for a young operator like myself, that is the vision, right? That's what I want to achieve is using that data to make better decisions in the future and bringing in the right people to help you make that. You're like, I'm handy with a spreadsheet, but I ain't no data scientist. So <laughs> bringing the right people in is, 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 is key and goes back to your point earlier of investing in the right people. So yeah. really, really awesome. And thank you for sharing that. Um, mate, we're coming to the end of the show. And at the end of every show, we'd like to dive into the top five investing tips. You ready to get into it? Shoot. There we go. <laughs> Try to Mate, give you question, my wisdom. Question number one is, what's your daily habit that you practice to keep on track towards your goals? Oh, God, I've gotten asked this question before. You know, I, I don't, I mean, look, I, I work out, I take care of myself, I eat well, I, I read, you know, what I can, I stay on top of my team. But my, you know, my role in my business has changed a lot over the years. So when David and I started this business, we were in the trenches. We were the ones finding the deals, evaluating the deals, um, running the deals. And, and so we built a lot of infrastructure. And I have 35, um, we, I should say not I, but we have 35 team members now spread across the country. And really what I'm doing now is just managing great people, mentoring them, making sure that they have opportunities in front of them. So um, I'm thinking more strategically about the company is how do we grow it? How do we give great opportunities for the people internally? How do we continue to um, you deliver you know, the same product to our investors and adhere to our mission? So you know, when you're an entrepreneur and you own your business, there's, like, there's not a day that you're not working. There's not a minute that you're not working. There's not something that you're thinking of. And my partner and I, you know, we're constantly on you know, the bat phone. Like if I have an idea, I'm calling him. If he's got an idea, he calls me. We're texting back and forth. And this has just been an iterative process over the years. You know, but there's, there's not, it's just, I would call it an obsession almost, you know? And so um, is there a daily habit? I, I think it's just, you know, being driven to succeed and not being afraid to fail and, and not giving up and just moving forward. I love it. That's that's you're so right. Being in the trenches in the in the early stages instills and ingrains in you a DNA that you do want to be curious about the next thing and about being a good leader and about evolving as that leader for your team because your team won't be successful unless you're there rocking up every day, showing it how it's done. So, so awesome stuff. Uh, question number two is, who is the most influential person in your business or in your career to, to date? That's a good question. Um, you know, I've had a lot of people who have kind of come and gone. I mean, I started with my grandfather and he would have been um, somebody who was very influential in bringing me into real estate. I mean, certainly my father has taught me a lot of great lessons about um, just business. And I'll never forget one of the things he told me when I was younger, um, he had an opportunity to work. He's in the, uh, uh, the law He's a lawyer and um, he had an opportunity to work with somebody who's the most prestigious attorney here in Chicago. And he did very well for himself. And I, and I said, well, why did you leave him? And he said, well, he offered me too much money. And I, and I said, well, what? That doesn't make sense. And he didn't at the time. And then he's like, look, he said, I was working for somebody who I thought was really smart and I respected them. And he made me an offer. And I said, if I take that, I'll never leave and I'll never go off on my own and I'll never do this. And so, you know, when I heard that, I sort of like, it, it made my, you know, just, it gave me shivers. Cause I'm like, that's so important because he always knew he wanted to be an entrepreneur. So my advice to anybody out there is before, you know, especially bet on yourself early on in your career, before you get so comfortable that you can't do it or, or you can't afford to take that risk. And I thought that was a great lesson, you know, that he taught me during that time. And then there have been other people who have really, I'm, I'm indebted to, um, you know, from my trading days and from my real estate career and, and everything and stuff. And I could name dozens of them, but I don't think there's, there's one single person, you know, categorically, I, I try to observe the world and take in what I can and respect people's opinions. And, and I listen and I hear, and I take in so many anecdotes and just try to use those in my life. That's awesome. I think it, it's, it's a good, 
it's a good reminder for all of us to consistently bet on ourselves, right? That's Because if you can't bet on yourself, then who can you bet on? Because no one's yeah. going to walk through your front door and, and hand you your dreams on a platter. And I, I think kudos to your grandfather for, for doing that because so many people would take that easy way of just getting paid more and getting a cushy life and never being – Never ne- the unfulfilled potential. I think that's that's an yeah. awesome way. And it sounds like you're you're very much dr- driven by the same thing. Well, it was you know I, I was lucky that my um, I was a broker down at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, and I'm lucky my boss didn't pay me too much because it was an <laughs> easy decision for me to go and trade. And but I use that you know that that um, that story that my dad told me to make that decision. I'm like, look, before my boss does pay me too much, like I better I better go after this right now. And it was the single best thing I ever did. And I thank him, you know, to this day for being cheap and not paying me a lot. So we're, <laughs> we're still friends and, you know, I, I can, I can talk to him like that. I'm like, thank God you didn't, you know, pay me more. So it's awesome. never gone off on my own. That's awesome. Yeah. Right, question, question number three is what's the most influential tool in your business? And a, a tool could be a, a journal, a phone, or it could be a piece of software that you can't run your business without. What is it? On top of my head, Excel, you yeah. know, and I hate to say that because real estate is not done on Excel. Um, you know, it, it's more than that. It's a physical asset. You got to go visit the property. Um, but a lot of what we do in this world, I just, I don't even understand how people, you know, ran real estate firms w- without Excel. So I, I wish, you know, if I'm thinking about it, I mean, we're building more technology in house now and that's becoming much more important as we grow and we, we integrate all the different departments amongst one another. I mean, you know, your, your phone communication is key, but you know, the, these are all just tools to give you better um, information. Right. And, and so like, even when we're using Excel, Excel is just corroborating what you, it's only as good as the inputs that you put into Excel and it just corroborates maybe, or helps you vet things out that you weren't thinking of um, along the way. And it can really help you um, make important decisions that, you know, 30 years ago, it, it would have been much more difficult, but that's why 30 years ago, cap rates were 10% and they weren't 4%, right? So right. It, it's a really important model, but it, it's used everywhere, uh, you know, across our business um, in virtually every department. So for managing the company, the cap table, evaluating deals, doing that. So, you know, that was one thing when I um, went and got my master's in real estate, I just became an Excel master and everything I did in that thing was just up and down, you know, learning the tools. And, and because, you know, when you're, when you're at my um, level, you have to understand the inputs, you know, and if I'm going to open up an Excel model, I want to know where to go and where to look and understand it. And just, you know, conceptually things have to make sense. So a lot of times I'm like, this doesn't add up, you know, and guys are like, well, what are you talking about? I'm like, this doesn't make sense. I'm looking at the numbers here on top line and sure enough, they're going into, you know, page 19, you know, to find the error. And they're like, oh, it doesn't. I'm like, yeah, it does. So you have to understand things at a very conceptual level. So you can also understand things at detail level. That's, that's so true. And, and amen. And because I, I couldn't agree more with you. And so many people buy these Excel spreadsheets online and try and go and do this multifamily business. And all the, the numbers are turning green. And you're like, no, that's not, you need to understand why they're turning green. So, I, and, and being yeah. at a high level of 50,000 foot and go, why is that telling me this answer? And do I believe in that? Yeah, but I would say the opposite too. There's sometimes you have to shut the Excel off and say, look, I know it's not telling me, but this is a great deal. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was talking about before is that we, we think that we can forecast with accuracy, but we had, and, and I, and I bring this up all the time because people are like, Oh, we can't pay another dollar. We can't pay two more dollars. I'm like, it's great real estate. We need like $500,000 is not going to make a difference. And when we go back and look at our history, there are deals that we had the same conversation on because we, we believe that we're right in these Excel models. And you look back and you go, you know, that $20 million deal we bought, we could have actually paid $30 million for that deal and done great because that's how well it did, you know, in hindsight, right? So you, you have to take yourself out of that. And I love it. You know, like sometimes people get caught up too much in these tools. Like I like, um, you know, Waze or Google Maps and you will literally have people following a map and going around the block. And I tell my kids this too. I'm like, look up every now and then, right? On where you're going. Cause they will just, they will literally just circle the block 10 times until they realize that the map is not working. You right, know? Right. And so just interesting. Love that. I love that. Mate, yeah. Final question for you. I want to get you out of here is where can people reach you to continue the conversation? They want to be in your sphere. They want to find out a little bit more about what you do. Where do they go? That's an easy one. 
Origininvestments.com. They can go there. We make it really easy for people to interface with us. We, um, you can interface with somebody right there on the website, or you can just email investor relations at origin and investor in origininvestments.com. So thank you. Awesome stuff. Well, mate, look, I want to thank you so much for jumping on the show today. I just want to reflect some of the things that I took away from today's show. I think what you what you hit on before is understand your, your Excel model is only as good as your inputs. That's the first. I've, I've always been a, being a former engineer. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a pretty good Excel jockey. Uh, that's been the first one. Investing in good people and then looking at your va- being a value buyer versus a momentum buyer. I think that's really important. I see a lot of you know young syndicators like myself getting a bit of momentum behind them and and, and just seem like they're running too quickly in in a market where we don't have the gray hair being that younger mid 30 year old i'm um, 35 i'm going to age myself here that it, it is important to look to people like yourself to understand that where the value is and i do believe what the last statement you made is sometimes you do have to turn the excel spreadsheet off because it's just a good pre, you know, piece of real estate that you believe in for the long term so mate i really want to thank you again for taking taking some time out of your day did i leave anything out in that wrap up no, that was great, Reed. Thank you for having me. Awesome stuff, mate. Well, look, enjoy the rest of your week and we will catch up very, very soon. You too. Well, there you have another cracking episode jam-packed with some incredible advice from Michael. Please head over to origininvestments.com. Please check out everything they do over there. I checked out their website before. Very, very cool stuff what they've got going on across the country. And I'm going to thank uh, you all for tuning into uh, tuning into this episode. We're going to do this all again next week. And remember, if you do like this show, please give the show a five-star review on iTunes. And if you want to reach out to me, head over to readgoosens.com. Again, be bold, be brave, and go give life a crack. 